welcome to the Worshipful Company of Information Technologies celebration of International Women's Day. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dawn Wright and I'm uh, Chair of the Equality Committee for the WCIT. Now we've got some special guests with us this evening. I can't see everyone on the screen, but uh, I believe the Lady Mayoress is with us. So welcome to Hilary Russell. And we have previous la uh, Lady Mayoress, Lady Wendy Parmalee. And I'm very pleased that we've got a lot of ladies from other liveries, as well as gentlemen, and um, some of my own colleague, common councilmen who are here as well. So welcome to you all, and thanks again for joining us. One of the reasons women's equality has always been a passion of mine is quite simple. Throughout my career in both telecoms and IT, I've attended so many conferences and meetings, and there was never enough women in the room. The noise was baritone. And now I'm not expecting a soprano when I walk into the room, but a contralto would be quite nice. And perhaps through tonight's discussion, we can think of some ideas that might help us achieve this. This evening, we're gonna be talking, to, uh, talking about women in the context of the IT industry. But I really think that similar issues surround women in many industries. These issues also concern many other sectors of our society, such as BAME community and our LGP community. The Equality Committee does what it says on the team um, and it seeks equality for all. But tonight's context is that of International Women's Day and we will be focusing on women and the theme this year, which is Choose to Challenge. Now I'm sure you've read their bios. This evening we have a very distinguished panel, all of whom champion women in some form but are also passionate about inequality surrounding opportunities for women. I'd like to introduce you to our four panelists and then they will tell you a little bit about themselves. Then we'll move on to a discussion followed by some questions. And if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat function and we'll ask them for you. So with no further ado, let's move on to the panelists. And tonight it's gentlemen first. Liveryman Tom Alube, CBE, CEO of founder of London-based Crossword Cybersecurity PLC. He's a non-executive director of the BBC and WPP, and his career has included Goldman Sachs, WPWC, and the London Stock Exchange. He's an honorary and advisory member at a number of prestigious universities, and he was named Britain's most influential black person in 2017. He was appointed a CBE in 2018. And last week, I believe, Tom, that uh, the rugby union announced that you, Tom was going to become chair. Uh, I think there's a ratification coming, so I don't know if we call you chair-elect, uh, but congratulations, Tom, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, just to introduce myself, uh, um, yeah, Tom Elube, uh, in this context, um, I uh, run a girls school in Ghana called the Africa Science Academy, uh, where we take young women from all across Africa uh, who uh, come to us to do A-levels in maths, further maths, physics. It's a charitable school and we uh, pay all of their fees and so forth. They do their A-levels, the Cambridge International A-levels in uh, under 12 months, in about 10 months, uh, and all of them pass pretty much every year, all of them pass. Uh, vast majority get A styles to Bs uh, and uh, they all go off to universities to do STEM subjects, uh, science and engineering and uh, 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 all over the world, across Africa, in the UK, the US, uh, Hong Kong, etc. Uh, so uh, I've been doing that for about four years. We've had over 100 girls go through and we get a huge number of applications. So as we come on to talk about girls interest in STEM and technology, uh, I'll share my experience on that side. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. Um, next uh, on our panelist list is uh, Liveryman Professor Sue Black, OBE. Sue is a multi-award winning computer scientist and a technology evangelist and digital skills expert. She was awarded an OBE for services to technology in 2016. She's a professor of computer science at Durham University, a UK government advisor, 
thought leader, trustee at Comic Relief, social entrepreneur, writer and public speaker. So over to you. Thanks very much, Dawn. Um, I guess in this context, what, what I'll say about myself is that um, I might be a professor at Durham University now, but I'm um, not a traditional academic or professor. I um, left school at 16 and didn't go back into education until I was 26, by which time I was a, a single parent with three children. And I went to the local college, Southwark College in London, did a kind of like a fast track maths course, then a computer science degree. Uh, and then a PhD in software engineering and have done various things uh, since then. I care deeply about, I think, I think because we lived in poverty for several years, I care deeply about people who don't get the most opportunities in life. And so lots of things that I've done have been focused on particularly uh, working with women and particularly technology because I love technology and I can really see how technology and education empower people it's empowered me both those things together have empowered me to bring my family out of poverty and create uh, a better life for us all and um, particularly on women from underserved communities so particularly um, more recently uh, women of color um, creating programs to help women of color get uh, into tech careers uh, so i'm kind of passionate about diversity and inclusion and about helping everyone to be able to have the opportunity to live their best life. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. And now we come to Sheila Flavel, CBE. Liveryman Sheila Flavel is the Chief Operating Officer, FDM Group. She has over 30 years experience in the global tech sector. And Sheila is a business leader who has a passion for enhancing diversity in the workplace creating exciting careers for the next generation of digital talent. She's won numerous awards during her career for services to the tech industry, and was recognized in 2020 with a CBE. She was named one of the 25 most influential women of the North American mid-market by CEO Connection. Sheila, over to you. Sheila, on mute. Oh, thank you, Dawn. Um, you'd think I'd know by now after a year of um, Teams and Zooming, but um, this year's colour for um, International Women's Day is purple, so I brought my purple hat because I didn't have a purple dress, <laughs> but I'll take it off for the moment, but I'll keep it close beside me to remind me of, of this year. Um, and this year's International Women's Day is all about justice and dignity. As Dawn said, I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer of FDM Group, and uh, it's a company my husband started 30 years ago. And I always say that by me joining the company, we created a 50-50 a gender split from day one. And we've maintained that uh, in our management team from that day to this day. And we're now a, a FTSE 250 company with over 5,000 staff. 33% of our staff are women. And we have a, in fact, we have a negative gender pay gap now. And in fact, a number of years ago, I set up a returners program, which I'm very proud of. And we've put several hundred of mainly women, although it's open to men as well, through the, the program. But very similar to Sue. Sue and I have known each other for many years. And by the way, it's lovely to see so many friends uh, here present tonight. But um, I left school at 16. And I joined the police force and that was before equal pay was introduced. And I was there before equal pay was introduced during the transition to equal pay. And I was there for the aftermath afterwards. So I completely understand what inequality is all about. But I did eventually go to university, but not until I had my children. And that's when I was working full time, looking after young children and going to university evenings and weekends. So it, um, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Sarah Windmill. Um, Liveryman Sarah Windmill is a Transformational Chief Information Officer with the uh, Ministry of Defence and previous to this was the Chief Information Officer with British Transport Police. 
Sarah has also been the chair of Charities Consortium IT Directors Group, and she has extensive experience in working for not-for-profit organisations in law enforcement, higher education and the arts. In 2019, Sarah was voted one of the most influential women in UK technology by Computer Weekly. Sarah, could you share some of your experience, please? Good evening all and, and thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, I, I reflect that um, uh, I have been through my life committed to diversity and uh, like so many of the others have, have seen, have been in rooms where I am often the only woman. Um, I think the fact that I've come up through the technical route of, of uh, IT leadership, I think my favourite moment was, was turning up to a training course uh, for Cisco networking. And there were 200 men and me in the room before we were set off to the different classrooms. Um, I love the ladies room at uh, CIO conferences. It is an exclusive club. We probably all know each other, but I reflect that at the Ministry of Defence, I'm one of a leadership team of nine, of which four are women. Uh, so we're really butt bucking the trend. Um, at the Ministry of Defence, I'm also the uh, uh, diversity lead for UK Strategic Command, uh, so uh, which includes special forces, um, uh, medical services, other elements. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I'm diversity lead for LGBT. I'm, I'm an out gay woman, and I reflect that often it is the woman part that is more challenging for people to deal with. Um, in my lifetime, I've been discriminated against in law. So uh, my wife is actually watching this evening. Um, we were unable to marry or indeed to have any legal relationship uh, for the first what, eight years of our life uh, together as, as a loving partnership. Uh, and yet still, uh, I, I recognize that people are making an effort and are trying to be inclusive in an LGBT world, but uh, that the uh, sexism is so endemic that uh, it is much more um, insidious and uh, is something I hit against far more than any issue uh, with my sexuality. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Thank you. We will indeed. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now, we've got a few things to sort of start our discussion off. And one of them, since the theme this year is Choose to Challenge, I just wonder if there's any of the panel who could let us tell us some insight into some of the serious challenges they've made with regard to equality. Um, maybe we could start with um, Sheila, would you have something you could share? Okay, um, sure. I, do you know, I was thinking about that question, Dawn, and as far as serious challenge, I couldn't actually think of one in my business life. Now, I challenge my male colleagues every single day of the week, but it's not about equality. I challenge them for good business reasons, because at FDM, we, we sorted that equality thing years ago, right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, 50% of our management team are women. Um, We've got women in tech initiatives. We're forensic about ensuring we pay our women the same as men. And also last year, most of the, more, yeah, definitely 90% of the senior leadership roles went to women. So I could go on and on and on about all the great stuff we do at FDM, but that's not, not the question. So from a business perspective, no, I haven't had a serious challenge. From a personal perspective, now that's a different story. I mentioned to you that I started life off as a Glasgow police officer, WPC 247. And um, when equal pay was introduced, we were turfed out of our cosy little police women's room. And I was particularly given a bit of a rough deal. I was given the city mortuary and I was given the fish market and the river. In fact, the mortuary attendant became my best friend um, because it was a nice place to hide at night. And it was really tough because the men wanted to set us up as an example of, of how we couldn't do the same job as them. We weren't equal. Why did we, why would they give us equal pay? Um, because we weren't as strong and burly as them. Well, clearly it failed because, you know, it, we never did go back to the old ways. But when I left the police force after a number of years, I went to live in the Middle East for 12 years. If I thought there was inequality, in the police force, it was nothing to what I experienced in the Middle East over the 70s and the 80s. And I returned back to the UK 
in 1990 uh, when the Gulf War started. But I thought by that stage, I was a young woman in my 30s with kids, I thought that inequality was just the way of the world because I'd never known anything different. And that's where FDM was born. And that's where we've been so rigid about ensuring that equality was the name of the game from that day to this. Thank you, thank you. Um, so have you got any um, um, examples where you've had to challenge an organization? Um, yeah, so, and I, I set up um, the UK's first online network for women in tech, BCS Women, so the British Computer Society Women's Network back in 1998. Um, and I, I did that because I was going to um, computer science conferences and um, my PhD supervisor had told me that I need to network at conferences and I was very shy so I found that quite difficult and so the first conference that I went to I, um, I set myself the target of talking to one person at that conference and to me that was a big deal and so there was a guy who, who gave a talk on stage he seemed very down to earth so I chatted to him in the break uh, and we had a great chat about our research and then for the rest of the conference he was staring at me every time I turned around and I, I kind of like, I didn't understand why and I got quite freaked out by it. Then the next conference I went to, um, I tried to chat to people again and um, ended up starting or trying to start a discussion with a couple of guys that were stand, we were standing near each other. Um, so I said something to them about the previous uh, session and they both looked at me and then looked at each other and started talking to each other and, and completely ignored me. Um, and so I kind of got the impression from that that I that I was no good at networking. I needed to network, but I was no good at it. And I just couldn't work out what I was doing wrong. And then sometime after that, I went to a women in science conference in Brussels. And I remember walking in thinking to myself, I'm rubbish at networking, but I've got to do it because my supervisors told me to. So I went in and got my badge and, and went over to get a cup of tea and then went and stood by a you know at a table. And the rest of the two days, it felt like everyone was talking to everyone. So I didn't really have to make any effort in particular to talk to anybody because there were conversations going on around me all the time. And it, it really helped me to realize that if you're in the majority, life is just easier. And it hadn't even occurred to me at the previous conferences that I was kind of in the minority, probably being about in the 10% women at the conferences. It hadn't even occurred to me that maybe I should go and chat to women at those conferences. It just, just the whole gender thing hadn't dawned on me at all. And so I came back from the conference in Brussels and thought I've got to set up a network to bring together women so that we can chat to each other about technology. So, you know, that's kind of how BCS Women was born. And so, um, that, that was the uh, London group of BCS women, which was fine. Um, but then I wanted to set up a national group because the, the group was so successful. And actually it, it was quite difficult in the BCS at that time to, to get that set up. So I had various challenges within the BCS, uh, with people within the BCS to make that happen. Um, but it was uh, Jennifer Stapleton, um, who luckily was the chair of the board that I had to uh, present at to get um, uh, approval to set up the group and and the thing is once I told my story of why I wanted to set it up everyone seemed to agree that it was a good idea but I think lots of people before hearing that story really didn't think it was a good idea I kept being told that it was sexist to set up a group for women in in technology and that seems quite outdated now but I kind of still hear it from time to time that it's sexist to have a group that's just specifically for women um, which seems crazy to me. Um, and I, th I think times are changing, but we're still kind of about, um, you know, 20% women in tech. And, and when I set up the group in 98, that was about 20% women in tech back then. So I think the environment's changed and, you know, we're all talking about these issues now, which we weren't really back then. Um, but I do think that we need to, to speed up the rate of change um, because I think we're all missing out. Yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right there. Thank you for those comments. Um, Tom, have you ever had to challenge an organisation? Yeah, yeah, once once or twice. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, uh, maybe my experience, it, it might sort of read across, obviously. Uh, you know, I, um, but it's, I think the thing, the, the one that sort of really 
jumps out at me that in a way I'm most proud of, but I failed at uh, uh, sort of totally, was that when I, when I uh, earlier on in my career, I applied for a job via a recruitment agent to a, uh, a big a big bank, if I said the name of the bank, uh, everyone would know it, a big international bank in the city of London. Uh, and the recruitment agent came back to me uh, and she said, uh, uh, she said, Tom, I don't know what you want to do with this, but I sent your CV over and the person at the bank said, Ilube, that's a funny name, is he black? And uh, I said, well, you can't ask that question. And the, the bank person said, look, don't mess about, just tell me what the answer is. And so she said, well, yes, he happens to be, yes. Uh, and then he said, uh, the person at the bank said, oh, haven't you been told we don't employ black people? Uh, and so she then came and told me and said, what are you gonna do about it? Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm a sort of young chap just trying to get my career going. And then this massive bank uh, has said this. So that's, that I think is where the interesting thing is, which, which I'm sure people can, resonate with is I then had a choice. Do I challenge or don't I challenge? Because I knew that if I challenged, the size and profile of the bank meant that this was going to be front page of FT material. Little Tommy Lube accuses huge, massive, well-known bank of being racist. This is, and therefore, even if I won, I, I struggled to get a job with any other bank because they'd say, oh, well done you, Tom, but we're not going to employ you. So, uh, and so I had to really kind of think, gosh, this is a career choice here. Do I challenge or don't I challenge? And in that case, I did decide to challenge. Uh, and I sort of in, mentally, I wrote off my career in that direction and said, right, I'm going to have to find a different career, but I can't let that pass. Uh, and so I challenged uh, and then I discovered what happens if one person on their own challenges a, a multi-billion dollar institution you simply just get crushed and eventually we were doing quite well with the commission for racial equality at the time and so forth but eventually someone senior at the bank said to the managing director of the recruitment company if you don't if your person doesn't withdraw this you're out of recruitment in the city uh, and so the managing director said to the young woman if you don't withdraw this and apologize to the person at the bank then you're out of the recruitment industry. And so she apologized and said it was all a terrible mistake. Uh, and that was, that was the end of it. Until LinkedIn very helpfully, uh, just a few years ago, decided that me and this chap at the bank, it suggested that we might, <laughs> we might want to be friends, which <laughs> and I was sorely tempted to endorse him for racism, but I sort of <laughs> let him off. Anyway, that was, that was my experience. Uh, and I was very proud that I sort of challenged, but I didn't necessarily, well, I didn't win, but that, that, that was how it played out. Yes, and, and a lot of people have to make that choice, don't they, the career or the, or the challenge. So yes, very interesting. Thank you, Tom. Sarah, have you got something you'd like to share with us? I'm sure you've got several. So I, I'm I'm going to talk about something which is on the face of it much smaller. Uh, and and Tom, goodness me, that really is shocking. I hope you could see all of us intaking breath on that. Um, it's smaller, but um, it's it's just a little taste of some of the insidious sort of. Um, corporate stuff in the IT world, I'm afraid. Um, and I reflect on, on going to register to become a Freeman of the city, which was a spectacularly enjoyable thing to do. And if there are some of you who haven't done it, I really recommend getting involved in the livery and, and having that opportunity. Um, and I, I was registered by, uh, by the deputy uh, clerk, uh, who, and we had a lovely conversation, and my wife was with me. Uh, we were going to go out and have some lunch afterwards, and we were filling in the form, and it was one of those computer says no moments. So, you know, what's your first name? What's your surname? What's your livery company? Name of husband? Are, are you married? That was the first question. Yes, I am married. Husband's name? Ah, okay, well, I, I don't have one of those. I, I have a wife. And a very embarrassed clerk, uh, deputy clerk said, um, ah, um, well, it, it, it says husband. Um, I had another lady like you and um, we, we decided that we'd put not married. And I'm afraid I, I, I said, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but actually 
this is something that for most of my life, marriage equality is something we've been fighting for. And it's incredibly important to me that I am now married and I am represented as such in legal documents. And, uh, and so I wonder if we might put my wife's name, Dina, um, in as my husband. And so officially, I have a husband called Dina Gornick in the City of London Records. Uh, and the application for Freeman that went through to, uh, I think it goes to Common Council, doesn't it, um, actually had uh, that I was married to Dina on it. Although, interestingly, it doesn't say husband on the paperwork. It just says married to. Um, but I do reflect on that. I wonder if I was a male applicant, would it have asked if I was married, who I was married to then? Um, I must ask my male colleagues um, what their Freeman experience was. So yes, that was my slight challenge. I, I then did actually make sure it was known to various members uh, of the livery. Uh, and I do understand that it was raised um, back at Guildhall. So yes, I have a City of London husband. Cool. I'm going to look out for that on Common Council when we have the uh, freedoms come past and see if there's any that have changed. And uh, if not, I will raise it because I think that's very important. Thank you for that, Sarah. Thanks, Dawn. Um, We've got um, another question, it's quite a big one really, and it's been going around for years, this one, and I, I'm going to throw it out there anyway, because I think it's quite a short one. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about the real big, big question. Do we agree with quotas or not? Are they a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, who wants to start me off with that one? Sue? Sure. So when I was younger, I definitely thought quotas were a bad idea. I thought they were unfair. Um, and we just didn't even consider that they could ever be a good thing. But, you know, I've now worked for, for 25, 30 years trying to improve the situation for women in tech and, and, you know, underserved groups. And I just feel like we'll never get anywhere if we don't use quotas. So I, I really think that we could use quotas as a short term measure to create a step change. Um, say maybe for a year or two years. And I think that using quotas will help us to, to all understand that actually there, there are a lot of benefits to having more women in tech, for example. And um, we also need to think hard about, so say for example, if we wanted, I don't know, say, say we wanted 50% women on boards, just as an example, then, you know, how would we make that happen in a, a way that would actually work? Well, what we could do is put together, you know, I, th I think there's a lack of kind of roots in. So, you know, there are people around with the potential to be able to do things, but a lot of the time there's no clear route in and there's no clear kind of training or support uh, for people to be able to go into those roles. So I think, for example, if we decided that we all wanted 50% uh, women on boards, then we could create a programme which would take women who had the potential to be on boards and put them through a programme that would help them um, uh, if they needed to be productive board members, to understand all the things that they would need to be um, cognizant of, to be on a board um, and a valuable member of a board. And, and then that could be part of then having the quota and um, encouraging, well, having a quota for, um, for women to be on those boards. Sorry, I feel like I'm rambling now, but I think you get the idea. No, 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 no you're doing very well. Thank you very much. So okay. Su Susie, yes for quotas. So um, yeah. uh, Tom, what, what's your view on, on quotas? Yeah, I have no problem uh, with with quotas at all. You know, I'm I'm a business executive. If I want to get something done, I'll uh, I'll put a number on it and push towards it. Uh, you know, I don't play about, and therefore, if it, if if it's something serious you want to get done, and putting a number on it and driving for it is the way to get it done, then then do it. I sometimes. Uh, yeah, and I, in in my school, when I when I set up the Africa Science Academy in in Ghana, and we were saying, right, how do we make sure that there uh, that lots of young women attend this school? Uh, I said, I know how we'll make sure lots of young women attend this school. 
we'll make it an all-girls school, so it'll have a quota of 100%, and then we'll solve that problem, and then maybe we'll let some guys in later if, uh, if that's a useful thing to do. So, uh, so I just go for it direct. And, and then sometimes, you know, you, you have this thing, and, uh, and in the black community, you have it as well, where someone will say, well, I don't want to be on this board if, uh, if maybe I'm just picked because of the quota or, or whatever. Uh, but but personally, I I have no problem with that at all. If you if you if you're going to give me a seat on something I know perfectly well I can do, then I, I just don't care what label you put on me. I will take that seat and uh, <laughs> and do it anyway. So uh, I, I don't worry about that for for a moment. The um, the huge numbers of sort of uh, you know, middle class chaps who sit on boards all over the place. They, they never wake up in the morning and think to themselves, oh gosh, maybe I'm only on this board because I went to this school or this, that and the other. It doesn't even occur to them for a moment. So I, I don't worry about that. <laughs> well, very, very true, Tom. And, and uh, yes, great common sense with the, with the school in Ghana. There's no way you can have, a, <coughs> have the quotas in there if they're all girls. Um, <laughs> Sheila, do you, do you have a view on quotas? Yeah, okay. Um, I have, I've got mixed views on, on quarters. I, I always read the Hampton Alexander report when it comes out. And it's, it, I think this is the last year. And I was really pleased, it, 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 it first came out in 2016. And I was really pleased to see that of the FTSE 350, 33% are now women on, on, uh, on the boards. Why not 50%? Mm -hmm. And no, that's not because there have been quarters, but there have been targets and they, they're quite different things. Now, I think there's only uh, uh, Burberry and Next are the two companies where there are more than 50% uh, women on the boards, but they're, they're fashion companies. So you would expect to see more women on those boards. The companies that are worse served are mining, financial services and construction. Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of women engineers and Cairns, um, Perhaps you may know Anne. You know she um, she's she's an, an engineer, um, and you know she sat on you know an engineering board. Why not? There's quite a few female engineers knocking around these days. Um, so with quarters, I think businesses prefer carrots to sticks. That's the first thing, and businesses don't like being told what to do. And when they're told what to do, they can often be resistant to doing it. So if voluntary targets don't work, then quotas can actually be an ethical alternative to creating diversity is what I think. So whilst there's work to get the number of women onto boards setting targets and naming and shaming, uh, if you read the, uh, the Hampton Alexander report, you know what I mean. You know, if you don't have women on the boards, it's up there in bold um, and, and that's a good thing. But my concern is that we might get the wrong people onto boards. So that's where I have a mixed view. Yes, we want more women on boards, but we want the right people onto boards. Um, I'm much, much more comfortable with cultural shift because that's what I've enjoyed at FDM. And that's what's worked for us. I say we've got three women on the board. Now, conversely, in Norway, Norway, um, 2007, they set up a, a law making it uh, illegal um, not to actually um, have uh, women on boards. And the shift has been in Norway from, uh, in 2007, they had 6% of women on boards and now there's 42%. So in that situation, it has absolutely worked. So mine is not, yes, it's not no. <laughs> <laughs> be very interesting to see how, how they accomplished that in Norway, wouldn't it? They must have done something very special. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I, I think this is a really interesting challenge um, and it's one that I, I don't think there's a right answer to. I reflect that the things that I've found to be useful is making sure that I have diversity of candidates 
when interviewing. So particularly when engaging with uh, agencies to bring forward uh, candidates to you, actually being really clear that having an entirely white male um, candidature just isn't going to be acceptable. Uh, and then letting people shine during the process. Um, I reflect on my time at the British Transport Police, who were really working hard in you know, cross-policing to diversify uh, the officers. Uh, ironically, in the IT team, I was the ethnic minority, uh, and I think we had 32 different countries and cultures represented across a team of 100 or so. Um, and what, what they were working to do was actually remove the threshold fear. So often, uh, you have minor minority communities who don't understand how to engage with the process, don't understand how the interview process works. So I reflect that doing a civil service uh, interview last year or year before for the first time, there's a very set structure to it. There's a very set set of expectations in how you will answer the questions. So targeting training at minority groups and saying, um, this is how you do the application form. This is how the, the process will actually work. Uh, and therefore empowering people to then enter themselves into the process and be treated on a, a level playing field. I, I That feels to me like a, a comfortable place to be. And that feels like taking positive action whilst being clear that everybody who goes through has gone through absolutely at the final um, mark on their merit. Good, yeah, good, I agree with that one. Um, now, one of the things that I struggled with running a business was to get um, female engineers, software engineers. And uh, I do remember setting out, um, uh, we were looking for an engineer, and we, we got 200 applicants, but there were zero girls or women in it. Uh, I don't know how you manage that. You, you can't get, get diversity if no one's applying for the job. So my next question really is, how do we appeal to younger women to get them interested into, into the IT sector? How do we get them early on and interested into STEM so that we have that pool sitting there ready to apply for our jobs? So Sue, I'm gonna ask you this one, you're in education. <laughs> Thanks Dawn. Well, I think the thing is we need lots of different initiatives all the way through. And I think, you know, we've, We've also, like my generation, we've grown up with a culture where, unfortunately, you know, if you ask me now to picture a scientist, I still see a man in a white coat. I can't, you know, I can't get rid of that. And so, you know, we've kind of grown up with this culture of men are scientists and, you know, like, if, however much we don't want to think that is kind of ingrained from the way that we've been brought up. And so I think, you know, that that tells us that we need different types of role models all the way through um our education and and before we go to school you know we need kind of in the media we need role models um you know kind of women in working in stem um so role models are very important we also need initiatives which uh encourage and support girls to um do things in stem like stem Etz, you know Anne marie maffedon's um amazing organization um you know kind of like showing girls that they can do stuff teaching them great skills and enabling them building their confidence in particular areas uh, and and then kind of showcasing them as role models so i think you know we need we need various initiatives at all different levels um all the way through education and, and preschool we need lots of role models around and we need to kind of together try and change our culture so that we all think hard about what we're saying, you know, uh, kind of at all times, particularly in a public space. Um, and, it, you know, it's very hard kind of policing what you're saying yourself. Um, but I guess the, the more you do it, the easier it, it gets. Um, and so that we can um, just really encourage girls and women to go into STEM. So, yeah, so I'd say uh, role models and initiatives all the way through the whole kind of lifetime. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I did a degree in chemistry and there was only two women in the uh, in the whole course. And uh, um, I don't really look like a, a chemist, really. Most, most people don't think I look like one. So <laughs> uh, I know what it's like, what it's like. And I, I don't envisage myself as a chemist. So do we have any other um, opinions, Sheila? How do we um, how do we encourage people to go into STEM and how do we appeal to them to carry on into the IT industry? 
Um, thank you, Don. Um, it's interesting what you say about, um, you know, people judge you by what you look like. Um, I was in Canada a year ago because I haven't traveled in this past year. And I was with a whole bunch of our new recruits. And these are young kids, maybe in the mid twenties. And my question to them was, what do you think I do in my spare time? And one said, I reckon you like Netflix. And the other one said, um, oh, you probably play a lot of golf. And somebody else said, I reckon you probably enjoy making cakes. And <laughs> the conversation, because I looked like their mums probably. And when I said to them, well, actually I fly helicopters. They were absolutely gobsmacked because that was not what I looked like. And, and, and that, that's, that's the same, you know, it, it, it is what um, Sue was saying. Uh, we, we have these preconceived ideas and these biases. Now, I um, was giving evidence at a common select committee a couple of years ago, and it was on um, skills, skills gap, skills deficit. And there were two headmasters also giving evidence on that same committee. And I was absolutely astounded when they were talking about the elective spare time that they had in, in the school. And they were encouraging the teachers to, I think they were offering games and physical education because they didn't have the knowledge to be offering um, anything to do with technology, or IT subjects. And so if we're not, if the educators aren't educated to provide that tech education, then what chance have these kids got? So we've got to get them early. And I think Tom probably, um, with his work with Ada College, can answer this much more eloquently than myself. So I'll be quiet now. Tom? Uh, actually, I think, Sarah, you were, you were about to come in, weren't you? Did you... I, if you're happy to, I, uh, thank you. Uh, I was going to say, um, what, what annoys me is we always talk about the tech. And for me, it's not about the tech. The tech is a means to an end. And I'm excited about the creativity that we can deliver into a, a business, into a workplace environment in order to help other people meet their business needs. So, you know, we've got to get away from talking about the technology and excite people about what they can do with it. You know, we don't talk about a pencil and go, oh, isn't it exciting, the pencil? We talk about how we use it. So for me, I've had an extraordinary career. I've looked after Yeoman Warders at the Tower of London. I've made the digitized collection of the VNA available online for academic research. And for any of you, by the way, to download a print quality image uh, and put it on your own wall free of charge. I've worked with police officers to look after the most vulnerable people in society and make sure that they get care and attention. And now I'm working with people to defend the UK against the, the Queen's enemies. You know, that's exciting stuff. What other career could take you through that whole kaleidoscope and, and be fulfilling and be exciting and make you want to get up every morning. And that's what technology gives. And that's why more women should be doing it because it's exciting, it's fun and it matters. Absolutely, I'd, I'd echo that in, in our, our efforts, uh, both in, in the school in Africa and the schools here, Hammersmith Academy uh, and uh, Ada College to, uh, recruit young women into, into the more sort of tech end of things. When we found, we've always found we have more success when we talk about the problems to be solved rather than the technology uh, itself. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and so that's been important to us. But what we found in Africa, we, we have, uh, with the Africa Science Academy, we have 20 times more young women applying than we can take. So uh, you know, each year we take uh, just a small group of 25 students, but we have hundreds, you know, 500 plus students applying. It's, it's astonishing from, from all, over the, all over the continent. So we, we are absolutely clear that there definitely isn't a shortage of young women wanting to get into STEM subjects. And we are literally 20 to one, uh, you know, trying to figure out how on earth can we expand the school to accommodate more students and, uh, and all the rest of it. I think what helps us is that they, they see that the school is, is for them, it's designed for them, yeah, everything about it. Whereas often you'll find that schools and STEM departments and so forth 
are sort of designed by guys for guys and then they will sort of accommodate a bit to, uh, to you know, sort of make it a bit more uh, uh, inclusive. But, but the starting point for what's, what's designed and who's there and who's running it, it it's, it's obviously not really designed uh, for uh, the people that it really says it's trying to attract. Whereas when you have a, a, a school which is clearly designed for young women who are passionate about science and technology and that's what they want to do, Young women see that and think, I think I want to go there and, and you know, you get them coming in. So I, I think that, that that's where some of the work needs to needs to happen. Yes, I just add, add, on, add on another point. Sorry, Dawn, yes, but I'm just do. reminding me. No. So, so we've had the same experience with Tech Up Women. So that's our programme that we run um, from Durham Uni with three other unis and 15 industry partners. Um, and that's a retraining program to take women from underserved communities in, directly into tech careers. And um, so, you know, the, the program takes women with degrees in any subject area with a passion for technology and trains them into uh, specific job roles that the industry partners decided upon. So for our first cohort, that was software developer, agile project manager, business analyst and data scientist. And um, you know we've had no shortage of applications for for those roles at all and we haven't really advertised uh the next cohort because we've been um struggling to find funding from industry to run the program again um but um we've got without advertising we've got more than 400 women signed up wanting to to take the program because they want to work in tech but there aren't very many clear routes from, say, a degree in medieval literature <laughs> into a technology role. But there are so many things within other degrees which aren't technology, which are just completely relevant for technology careers. And I think we kind of need to think outside the box a bit more. So I do think if there are clear pathways, and this is, again, specifically for women, then the women are out there that are interested or the girls are out there that are interested, but there, there aren't that many clear pathways. And another very quick point, um, someone said, I think someone tweeted the other day um, about taking their daughter along to um, like A-level choice night or GCSE choice night and their daughter um, being persuaded out of doing uh, STEM subjects or, or the sciences by the teacher um, because they didn't get good enough results even, no, because it was uh, too hard or something because, um, because they wanted to study physics or something like that. And actually I had the, I had the same experience when I was at school a very long time ago, being talked out of doing chemistry and encouraged to do home economics, which I then did and failed. Um, and more recently, my youngest daughter, 17, with her A-level choices night, um, going to meet the teachers, she said to the head of maths that she was interested in doing maths. And he said, maths is hard, you know. And I just thought I wasn't there. So because if I had been, <laughs> I might have said something uh, quite loudly. Um, unfortunately, I was in Durham and uh, we live in London as well. So um, my husband was there. But, um, you know, this sort of stuff is still going on. And so I tweeted about that the other day. And there's just so many stories of so many parents saying that their children, you know, particularly their daughters, being discouraged even now from, from taking A-levels in the sciences and being encouraged towards careers in nursing. And of course, there's nothing wrong with nursing, but if you've got, you know, straight A's in science subjects at GCSE, nursing might not be the first choice of career for you. So I do think, you know, we have to educate the educators as well so that they understand all of this and are aware of you know, the small things that they might be saying, which could completely change someone's career, you know, and kind of push them off in, in the wrong direction, really. Absolutely. Thank you for those thoughts. And and uh, uh, I love the text exciting because it is you don't go around selling widgets. I was on the sales side. You sell you sell the idea of what the technology can solve, what it can do for the business, how it can make it more effective, efficient and all those things. So very, very good points. Um, from all the panel, thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to um, a question actually from our um, Kerry, from uh, who's our panels warden. And uh, Kerry is a, a JP, so she sits on the magistrates court, so she's sort of seen a lot of this firsthand. And she says there's sort of three things in the the past pandemic year that have affected women globally. 
Um, one of them is a major number of redundancies have been women. Um, a 50% increase in spousal and partner murders and uh, domestic violence. And obviously the systematic erasure of the word woman from documents. Um, evidently this, is, this has been happening as well. Um, now, obviously tech has allowed people to work from home. So it's enabled um, people to be at home with their spouses and have you know, the increase in um, violence that's been going on. And um, Kerry just wondered what, what your views were on this. Um, who should we start with? Sheila, should we start with you on that one? Yeah, that'd be lovely. So Don, sorry, I was reading the chat when you started. So the question is, what's our view on domestic violence? Yeah, and the, the, the majority of redundancies have been around the pandemic have been women and uh, the increase in violence towards women. At okay, family. well, uh, you know, first of all, women have certainly been in the bullseye of the pandemic and sectors that employ largely women, such as hospitality and retail, um, have been very, very badly hit. And a lot of these women are women between uh, 25 and 34 years of age. So there's a lot of low, lowly, lowly paid um, women, uh, young women who've been affected. Um, I think young women are often let down by the education, ed educational system, uh, e educational sector that uh, funnels them into jobs that perhaps society values lowly. And this is, you know, goes back to what we were talking about, educate the educators. And if we don't educate the educators, this is what happens, you know, a consequence of, you know, it, it, it just escalates. Um, I think uh, organisations, in order to combat this, we need to have better parenting policies. Um, then we go back to unconscious bias, somebody put in the chat that I was reading, but, um, you know, we should have um, blind uh, scanning of CVs, you know, without names, because, you know, go back, going back to Tom's point, you put a name that has a, maybe an African name, you think, ah, oh, instantly, what does that person look like? And that may well, you know, create this bias. Um, and so blind scanning of CVs, strength-based assessments, all of this good stuff, I know that we apply FDM, you know, should be applied by employers. With the domestic abuse question, now the government paid, uh, I believe it was two million pounds uh, to support helplines, uh, domestic abuse helplines. That is a ridiculously low sum of money. No, where, where's that going to take? Now, the minister for um, the minister for whatever, for whatever it is, was it equalities? I'm not quite sure which minister it was. I remember her comment saying she thought that this was very generous and, and a fair amount of money. It is absolutely not. The number of women, I've read so many cases of um, you know, one man, uh, when, lock, when, when lockdown was announced, they were watching television, him and his wife, and he, um, he turned to his wife and said, let the games begin. You know, we hear about women being raped over and over again. It is disgusting. It is terrible. So until we get better government support, I can't see things changing. But, but hopefully we'll be out of lockdown soon and there will be change by that Let's reason alone. So. Let's hope so. Um, Tom, have you any views on, on this question? Um, I, I think I can only comment on it from what I've seen is you know, with, with our students, with our young women at, at the Africa Science Academy, when pan the pandemic hit and they, they went home and we gave them as much support as we could to learn for uh, to continue learning from home and we gave them laptops and we tried to sort about sort out internet access what we had underestimated and what i've now learned over the last year is the experience for young women and i i, I think the, the messages for all women working from home is very different uh, and in and challenging in different ways to the experience of if i was sending a group of young young men home so i'm i'm sending you know we're sending the girls home with the equipment and they're going home and then we don't hear from them and then we get in touch with them and say what's happening and they say uh well you know i have to cook for all my brothers and i have to go and sell in the market and this, that, and the other, and I don't have time to to do the work. We we forget the the mass of 
domestic uh, work that falls on their shoulders as soon as they're uh, at home again. And actually we realized that what we were doing by bringing them into the school and, and part of the reason why they were just learning so incredibly quickly is we were lifting that, that entire burden uh, from them. And so when I hear companies now and companies that I'm involved in here and so forth saying, well, you know, this sort of working from home is, is going to be the new normal and this, that and the other. I sort of think, is, is enough work being done? Because I'm not reading about it and hearing it. I can't think of an article that I've read on it recently about the different experience for men and women in this working from home uh, environment. So I think, you know, work, really good quality work and conversation uh, in that area before we just jump to this is the new normal and this is how we're all going to work. We need to see more of that work and study, I think. Very good points, Tom, very good points. Sarah, have you you've got any views on this? I'm gonna bring close to so the police. I, so I, <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I reflect on what the other panelists have said, absolutely agree that, that the whole part-time and lower skills and the higher responsibilities of working at home absolutely have unfairly put the burden on, or unequally put the, the burden on women. Uh, I certainly reflect on some of the conversations I've had with uh, colleagues, particularly those who are homeschooling as well, and the, the, how that seems to have fallen to the women as well. So it's just another thing to add, add to that whole piece. Um, I, I reflect on the domestic violence. I think in, there's a, a sort of implication that this is... Um, falling on women more yes there are more there is more domestic violence on women but it's also women on women men on men and uh, women on men um, and I think it reflects generically that all of us feel much more under pressure and really reflect how much we need personal contact with other people and, and I think everyone's feeling this we are all counting the days till we can get out and chat with other people and socialize in a different way um, but I would like to focus in on this this last piece about um, the erasure of the word woman from documentation um, and in particular census because I hadn't heard about this before the question was sent to me so I, I went away and did some research and it's actually quite interesting and I, I recommend for the geeks of you amongst us um, that you go to the Office of National Statistics website, where they've got an entire page detailing the, the extensive research they've done about how exactly to phrase the questions around gender and sex. Uh, and they, they, this is not something they have done lightly. I also reflect in my um, looking at my own family history that past censuses have got M's and F's. So it says male or female, um, not, not uh, woman or man. Um, and what I would say is the reason this is so important is because at the moment, um, you know, there's a huge debate and there's a whole set of anger and noise and heat around trans people. And right now we have no idea how many trans or uh, gender um, non-conforming people we have in this in, in this country. Estimates anything between 200,000 and 600,000, but we have no actual stats because it's never been collected in the census. So what the census is seeking to do by my reading is to allow people to identify uh, their sex and their gender. So the difference in that being one is, um, you know, a doctor looking at your genitalia and making an assessment of whether you are male or female. Uh, and the other is the identity that you hold to be true of yourself and may actually be reflected in your personal documentation and your legal status if you've gone through gender reassignment. So from my point of view, I, I believe that none of us are equal until all of us are equal. And so I would hate to, to put, hang my petard on the word woman if that meant it excluded some of my trans brothers and sisters or, or those who are gender non-conforming from actually being their true self. You know, I know how that feels to be excluded in, in a, a, a national, in a, in a um, you know, legislative way, you know, because that's happened to me personally. So what I, I would urge is a sort of common sense approach. Let, let's all of us describe and categorize ourselves in a way that's inclusive and supportive. And if that means that I personally don't see the word woman on the census, I'm willing to do that because it means others will get what they need. 
Okay, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, Sue, did you have any comments on this uh, question? Yeah, I'd quite like to talk about the domestic violence issue. I mean, being a, a survivor of domestic violence myself, I, I guess it kind of resonates strongly with me. And I know that if I hadn't been able to go to a refuge with my three small children uh, when I had, we could either have ended up dead or we would have been homeless because I had no family or friends that I could go and live with with my three small children. And so just imagining, you know, like what on earth would my life have turned out to be um, if that had happened? There's no way I'd be in the position that I am uh, now. And so, I really feel like, you know, particularly when we're, you know, like I live a very comfortable life now, particularly when we're comfortable, you know, it's very hard to have an insight into what lots of people's lives are like, uh, you know, and I think back to myself at that time and I had no, I had no money, I had no other family. And so being able to go to a refuge um, in a situation of domestic violence was my only refuge you know there, there was there's was just nowhere else I could have gone and so that wouldn't only have messed up my life it would have messed up my three children's lives who and who are now sort of successful adults and and now all have children and so then you know like my grandchildren and so the the effect of not having this support for people ripples down the the generations it's not just one person each time you know it's multiple people and multiple generations. And I, I feel like, you know, we're a rich country. We may not feel it at the moment, but we are a rich country. And we do have enough resources to look after um, people who are in the most difficult situations and are, um, you know, without money, they're not um, able to, to look after themselves. And particularly in situations where there's violence occurring in the home we should be making sure that we have provision for everybody that needs it. Um, and, you know, a safe home is kind of like, you know, I don't know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or whatever. If you, if you don't have a safe place to live, your life is gonna be terrible, you know, and we should not have people in that situation in this country. I just think there's no excuse for it. So I think however much it costs, we should be providing refuge spaces for, for everyone that needs them. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, very personal insight, Sue. That's uh, that's really good of you. Um, we have we have some questions coming in, so I hope you don't mind if we sort of move on to some of those. Um, so this is from a colleague of mine who's on uh, Common Council, Rahana Amir, and uh, she says, as a tech entrepreneur, I've seen this quite a lot in my experience. We hear a lot of accomplished women say that we need more women in tech startup world. But when it comes to investing in women owned companies, these sentiments do not translate. How can we challenge this and how do we address it? So who wants to take the, uh, the money question? <laughs> uh, Sheila, do you think that would be one for you? Yeah, I can, I can take that. And uh, Don, I have to say that you made me smile, um, it was Sarah actually, sorry, not Don. Sarah, you made me smile when you were talking about sex you know male female what's on the form and I do remember going on my first holiday abroad from the village there was a whole bunch of us going and one of the young lads who was coming with us he had, he had um, fill out a passport form and as you know on the passport form it said sex well he answered once <laughs> <laughs> that is not a joke <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, sorry, I just had to share that with you, Sarah. Um, women entrepreneurs, um, I've, I've spoken at a number of um, networking events, business events, uh, where I, there were a number of, where there were a number of women entrepreneurs who were um, in early stages of their business. And I've heard this quite a, quite a lot, Dawn, that, um, women entrepreneurs often find it difficult to get funding. Now, I, I haven't personally experienced that, um, but it, it, it clearly is the case. And, but having said that, there are still a lot of successful women entrepreneurs out there who do receive funding. So I think it's, and uh, in fact, not, uh, maybe, you know, Tom can answer this better than I, but, you know, I know that in America, um, in certainly New Zealand, uh, 
where they're at Goldman Sachs, in fact, they have a, a scheme in New Zealand whereby um, if, if there aren't women on the board, they won't fund the business. And they really put, they have a specific fund for female led entrepreneurs. And likewise in um, Washington DC, um, there's a government pot of money where um, they particularly, uh, they will only fund female led businesses. I'm not sure that exists in the United Kingdom. I haven't heard about any scheme there, but it would be good if, if there was. But we do have lots of um, hubs now in London, particularly where there are female entrepreneurs um, and there's, I think at the moment, there's quite a lot of money um, looking for a home and mm. certainly angel investment as well. So it's, I'm not, I can't speak from experience, but I do think it is tougher for women starting out. Yes, I think so. Um, Tom, do you have any thoughts on this? Have you yeah, in the I, business yes. world? Definitely tougher for women raising money, tougher, uh, tougher for minorities, tougher for women. Um, the, and it sort of goes back to the VC firms are, um, uh, are not, they're not diverse. Um, they, they, you know, to my mind, haven't really embraced it and, and figured out what they're, what they're going to do about it. They, they, they really haven't you know, got their minds around it. So, so they need to pull their socks up. Uh, I think. Um, I think also there's kind of a, a myth about entrepreneurship, you know, what we see on TV and so forth, the kind of entrepreneur is, you know, is the macho shout you down, you know, you pitch and you live or die by that one pitch and this, that and the other. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been an entrepreneur for the last 20 years building businesses it's not really what I do. And there are lots of different ways to, to build businesses and, and so forth. So I think that, you know, there's, there's that kind of myth of that's how you're supposed to be. And, and the investors are a bunch of young lads who often haven't actually run businesses themselves. You know, they, they, uh, they, they come up through the accounting path and so forth, or the finance path, and then they, they have the money and they're doling it out. And they're, they're looking for people to conform to their view of what an entrepreneur's like, and and it sort of keeps feeding off of each other. So I think you sort of need to tell that entrepreneur story in a different way. Um, and at this stage, maybe it'll change in the future, but at this stage, um, some funds that stipulate that there have to be women on the boards or women-led, or uh, and so forth, uh, are. are are a definite help in kind of starting to break uh, break through. Maybe down the track, you won't need that, but I think right now that would really help. Tom, if I can maybe just add to, to what you just said there, something just sprung to mind. I think whilst being a woman is tough, as a husband and wife team, it's probably tougher because we've been told many times in the past to our faces, I don't invest in husband and wives. And I've heard that on numerous occasions. So the lady who asked the question, just make sure your husband's not alongside you on the board. Well, Sheila, I relate to that because I was part of a husband and wife team as well. So I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, Sarah, do you have any view on this? So, so I, I have had the most vanilla employed career all my life. So I, I can't talk about personal experience of, of going for funding. But I, but I do reflect that, um, shout out to Sue Black, BCS Women, supported me early in my career where all of us dared each other to go and ask for a pay rise because it, it wasn't something that was sort of a natural thing for women to do. And, and um, it was reflected that men would naturally do that if they felt that they were doing well. And, you know, I think all of us went and we reported back on the uh, on, online group as it, as it was then. And uh, uh, many people got a pay rise to their surprise. Uh, and equally, um, everyone was encouraging each other to get their chartered IT professional, you know, and the, uh, increase their membership of BCS. And, and I reflect that I've, I've sub subsequently learned about this modus of control that if, if women are not sure, they tend to step back, assess the situation, and when they're 100% confident, then you'll step forward. Whereas men, we teach them, we absolutely ingrain it to them, mothers, um, to 
be brave, step in and, and hold your space. And so when they're less confident, they'll step in. And I wonder if that is actually reflected in the number of people asking for that funding. Is this another of those examples where I don't put myself forward because I haven't got 100% of the criteria on a CV or, you know, in the job advert or, you know, or I, I'm, it's only me. I don't ask and I don't talk about how brilliant I am and I don't ask for a pay rise. Is it another? I don't know. As I say, very vanilla, employed, traditional career myself. Very strong idea, Sarah, and I, I think you could be right there. Um, I don't know, Sue, do you have any views on this? Yeah, was that, was that you there shaming mothers there, Sarah, for um, how they bring <laughs> up their boys? Well, I, I, I reflect, you know, I, re, I reflect that, I, and, you know, I've done it with my nephew as well. Come on, you know, be, be a brave boy, step in and you go. And what, and fathers don't do that? <laughs> Guilty as charged, <laughs> unconscious bias. We all, we all do it, right? Um, so, yeah, totally um, agree with most of what Sarah said. Um, and I think, I think in general, our society, we bring girls up, to look after everyone else and kind of put themselves last. And we bring boys up to get out there, go for it kind of thing. And so, you know, there were probably good reasons for that back in the day, some hundred years ago or whatever, but you know, it doesn't, life isn't like that now. I think we don't need those gender stereotypical roles. And um, I think that, you know, a, a lot of the issues that we have in the workplace and with mental health come down to these kind of stereotypical role model kind of um, boxes that we, whether we want to or not, end up being in. And so I think, you know, things like imposter syndrome, I think, particularly in women, comes from women being brought up to look after everyone else uh, in the home, you know, put yourself last, don't show off, which I heard like five million times when I was growing up. Um, and, you know, very strange. Don't answer back, don't show off. So, you know, kind of shut down basically from having any opinions, um, but make sure everyone else is okay um, in terms of has everyone got enough sandwiches and enough to drink, uh, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And so I think then when you're in the workplace, you've been brought up to behave like that. It's then very difficult to put yourself forward, to show off in quotes, tell everyone what you're doing. Um, and if you aren't able to do that, then you've got imposter syndrome. So, you know, it's I just feel like that makes things very difficult for women. And then I think there are issues uh, for men as well in terms of so you're brought up as a boy. You've got to get out there, like Sarah says, and you've got to compete and everything. And then when you're potentially a manager in the workplace, you've got to take into account everyone's feelings around you to be a good manager but you've not been brought up to, to know how to do that. So of course, for some guys, it will be fine. But for lots of men, they just won't know how to approach that at all. So that maybe causes them some issues in the workplace. And also things like boys, you know, not, not being able to cry, you know, like be a, a big boy or whatever, stop crying. So you're not allowed to express your emotions when you're younger. And then later on, of course, that can cause mental health issues because you're not used to talking to people about things that are going wrong in your life, potentially. And I think that's why we've got a higher rate of male suicide than, than female suicide, because as women, we're kind of brought up that it's socially acceptable to talk to each other when we've got problems. But for men, not so much. And I think that, you know, it creates issues uh, for men as well. Very good point, Sue. Thank you very much. Um, we've got some uh, extra questions coming in now. And uh, if it's OK, I'm going to ask one of them. Um, can I please ask the panel's opinion on the UK government's gender pay gap reporting? Anybody have any ideas on that one? Because... <laughs> No? Yeah, I'll take yeah. that one because I, I actually create our gender pay gap report. Um, and I've been very involved with the Equalities um, Office since reporting was, was introduced. Um, I, I'm all, all for it, if, if that's a question, are we for or against? Um, I think it's a good thing. It's, you know, if, if for only the reason that companies need to understand what the gender pay gap is in order for them to build strategies, in order for them to improve. Now, some organisations will find it really difficult to improve the gender pay gap. You know, construction, for example, um, male-dominated industries. But nonetheless, I'm sure there's 
things that they can do. Um, I, I've still rep I've reported in 2020, and I will be reporting in 2021 whether the government um, mandates that we have to or not, because I think it's good to continue the practice and to demonstrate to our stakeholders, our investors, that we're serious about this. And we, we, I think it's it's a positive step for organisations to take. Now, we have always had a zero gender pay gap, our bonus gap has gone into negative, but not bad negative, it's just minus, I think minus one point something percent, which is fine. And a lot of that is because we give one pence share options to all our staff who've been with us for two years. And when the share options best, they're um, deemed to be a bonus. And so that sort of, and we give them right down to the receptionist. So we have a lot of women, you know, women who um, perhaps wouldn't otherwise get a bonus and hence, you know, we've got a very good bonus gap. But I think it needs to go further. We're also measuring ethnicity. And I think it's important for organisations to step outside of the gender card and start measuring all forms of diversity. And then you really will have a truly inclusive workforce. But until you know what the problem is, then you don't know what you're measuring or you don't know what you're trying to achieve. No, certainly. If you can't, you can't manage it. You measure it. You can't manage it, can you? Um, so, does anybody else have any other thoughts on the government's gender pay gap reporting? I'm not seeing any. Okay, I'll go on to the next question then. Now, this one's um, well. We'll see. Is the internet for everyone, and does that include people in the sex industry? <laughs> They, these are not mine. The only thing I can say. <laughs> um, Tom, can I throw that one to you? And then maybe Sarah can come in. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I say it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the the internet, it, the internet, the web. It, it it should be it should be for everyone. Is you know is it? Gosh, I, I don't know, but. You know, it should be. It should be um, a a an empowering environment that that lets you that lets you do so much more than you'd otherwise be able to to do and achieve. Um, uh, but gosh, there there are there are so many issues and challenges uh, uh, with it. But you know, on 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 balance. Um, you know, if people say, well, would it be better if the World Wide Web you know, wasn't there and things went back to the way they were or, or not? Well, no, you know, it, it, to me, it's, it's there and it's amazing and, uh, and, and so forth. But there, you know, there are just there are just so many challenges and it is it is biased, not not it itself isn't biased, but uh, except for, and we may come on to the, the way that AI and algorithms themselves are, uh, you know, can be biased. Um, but I think that you know, we've, we've got to figure out how to make it uh, uh, available and uh, applicable and usable by, by everyone. Um, I think I will have to leave the question about sex workers to my esteemed colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> follow that eh? um, so so I I reflect that the internet is a reflection of humanity isn't it it's got the best of us and the worst of us and uh, what it enables is for all of us to find the best and the worst so um, do I believe that we should get to a place where we can't find what we want to find? Well, that to me starts to become big brother and I reflect on certain uh, international, uh, certain nations who do control what internet access their states have. And I, I don't think that's a good thing for democracy and freedom. And um, yeah, it's, that, that means we're going to have to embrace the worst as well as the best. Um, and, and that's the downside to it. Okay, any other thoughts on that one? Um, doesn't look like it. Um, I, I would actually like to cover 
AI and algorithms, because um, something Sue said to me a, uh, about a week ago really sparked something. And I think it's things that I didn't understand. And um, it's, it's the bias against women within the algorithms and the AI that's come about. So Sue, do you think we could cover that off? Because I found it really interesting. Sure, thanks. Um, so my kind of research career has mainly been in software engineering, but more recently I've moved into AI um, and, and bias and have set up a research center focused on, on bias in AI. Uh, and our aim is to bring together industry, academia and government to have a go at solving some of the biggest issues in this area. So if we think about AI software and algorithms, the, the, the decision making that's going on is going to affect everyone on the planet in lots of different ways. And if we think about the people that in general are creating that software or writing those algorithms, um, they're mainly white middle class American males. Um, so whether they they perceive uh, that they're biased or, you know, they they uh, are even kind of aware that they're that they're biased um, is an issue. Um, so recently, so I've recently moved into this area and I've got a couple of PhD students and one of the first first things that we were looking at was this, um, I think it's called a language model called GPT-3, which is kind of like a I guess an AI brain that you can um, you can give it inputs and it'll output um, uh, to you. So, for example, if you uh, type in "people are," it will give you some output. You know, like "people are," I don't, it could be anything uh, at all. Um, are humans or something um, is what it will come back with. Um, so, we just kind of started playing around with this big kind of AI brain. Um, which is, you know, cost lots and lots of money and is kind of being championed as, as an amazing, I guess, AI brain that, that we can use to do all sorts of things. And um, with uh, my PhD student, we thought, well, we'll just have a look and see if it's biased, where it's biased. And we thought, you know, maybe it will take some time to work out where the bias was um, and, you know, being quite new to this area. And so I got my PhD student, or we decided that she would just type in um, people are, women are, men are, um, and just get like a hundred responses uh, to, because you can just kind of get response after response from uh, the language model. Um, and then we would look at what the output was and see, was that biased or not? Um, but, you know, we thought it would take some time and we'd have to kind of like go through a really detailed, uh, nuanced investigation. But it was very clear within about two minutes that actually it was really biased. Um, and so, you know, just putting in women are, there were, were, were lots of responses to do with um, violence towards women, with rape, with uh, just um, kind of like violent language in general. Um, with a, with abortion, with so loads of kind of sexualized content. So so that was very strange. And then if you if you put in men are, um, you would get stuff again, which was quite violent um, a lot of the time. And so you know it wasn't even just about um, a, you know kind of like gender. It was just about how violent the content was that came out. And so we uh, looked at so. So why does this happen? And found that the a lot of the um, that the model was was trained on uh, data, which um, I think mainly came from um, Reddit. Which I don't know if you know Reddit, but it's um, a kind of I don't even know how to describe Reddit. Can anyone say what Reddit actually is? Um, but basically, there, there's lots of uh, conversations in Reddit, which a lot of the time again are white American middle class males talking to other white American middle class males. And so it had used some of uh, a lot of a lot of that data to to train this language model to be able to respond to inputs um, from anyone that's typing stuff in. And so, you know, this isn't doesn't really seem to be seen as a massive problem by the people that have produced it. And I don't know if anyone's seen, um, followed the, um, the firing of uh, Timnit Gebru, 
um, and now Margaret Mitchell. So two women who are working around the area of bias in AI at Google, um, who have both been fired over the last few months. And it's to me, it's not really clear why they've been fired because apparently it was to do with things that they were writing papers that they were writing research they were doing but then when you read the papers they seem quite innocuous so these these things are, are linked i'm not sure exactly what's going on there but i think you know we really all particularly as technologists have to be aware that there are things happening in this space which are going to affect billions of people and we need to understand what's going on there and potentially try to change what's happening so that we make sure as much as possible that all of these tools which are going to be used in the decision making process for everyone on the planet are as unbiased as possible and that's a very very difficult thing to achieve um, obviously but I think we you know we really need to be taking uh, note of what's happening and working together to make sure that um you know some terrible things don't happen down the line because of this type of um ai software yeah that's thank you very much for covering that officer that's very important points we've covered um <clears throat> we're actually coming to the end of our debate we've run out of time um so firstly i'd like to thank the panel um professor sue black sarah Wimmill, tom alube cb and sheila Favreau CB for a thought provoking and lively discussion. Um, it's been great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the whole staff and my fellow Equality Committee members who have helped put this together, specifically Isla Kennedy and uh, Vicky Cooper. And I'd like to leave you, if I can, with one quote before I hand over to the master. Um, Diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice. So may we learn as the uh, and teach the world to start making the right choice. And uh, I'd like to hand over now to Mark Holford, who's the master of the company, and he's just going to spend literally two minutes um, telling you a little bit about us. Thank you all for joining us so much. Um, just to explain, what does the master mean for those of you who may not be involved in the delivery company? It means I'm the chairman and I hold the office for a year um, and uh, I'm about halfway through my term. Um, delivery companies uh, were originally founded in the Middle Ages. The oldest is the Weavers, which were founded in the 12th century. There are 110 of us, and we are proudly number 100. Um, we're a membership organization. We have 800 members, and we have four pillars. Uh, the first is um, fellowship with each other. Um, we, I think, amply demonstrated that tonight. There are five of our members, uh, including Dawn. Um, what I think we have much more to do uh, is to do with diversity. Um, we don't even match industry levels at the moment uh, for people with diverse backgrounds. Um, and that's particularly what Dawn is working on. But I, I would really welcome the thoughts of the panel on how we can speed that up, because I think we should and, and need to do that. Uh, the second pillar is uh, supporting our industry. Well, we clearly do that. That's to do with the tech industry. Um, and we're trying to increase uh, engagement, for instance, also with the BCS and that, and that sort of thing at the moment. Um, our education uh, pillar has already been mentioned tonight. We helped found the uh, uh, Hammersmith Academy along with the Mercer's Company, who are number one. And we also support the uh, uh, Lillian Bayliss Technology School in Vauxhall. On both of those, we uh, appoint governors. And the last uh, uh, pillar, which is a very important part, is our charity. And you can really split that into two activities. One is volunteering, and we have lots of that, um, um, the sort of some of the best known areas is our support for the arts uh, world where we have something called IT for Arts. Um, we're also involved in coming to uh, uh, Sue Black's point about AI for C, uh, AI for charities. Um, we have donated uh, large or granted large sums of money to two charities who are then sharing it with another 16 charities, including some well-known major charities. Um, the other part, of course, is raising money and, and, and making grants. In 2019, we actually gave away 400,000 pounds, but on average, probably we're more like giving away between 150, 200,000 in, in a normal year. Um, over the last year, we've also raised 18,000 pounds by people donating for attending events and also for the money that they've saved by not attending dinners or not traveling or whatever. Um, and I would encourage you perhaps tonight, if you've enjoyed tonight, 
perhaps to give a little something to our charity um, to increase that figure. Uh, and, and if you want, if the easiest thing is to go to wcitcharity.org.uk, all one word, WCI, and there's a donate button. Uh, so that's all you have to do. Um, and uh, the, other, the other way we, we, um, we raise money is our, our um, uh, members give over a hundred thousand pounds a year on regular donations in, in our con continuous committed giving scheme. And I should say, of course, one of the reasons we've had this 18,000 uh, pound scheme to, to raise substitution money, if you like, is because um, A, our income has dropped and B, um, uh, our events has not been earning us money. So um, I was reminded when talking there about that, funny enough, about somebody was talking about asking and not being willing to ask. Um, I'm in a parallel universe involved in fundraising and I was always taught uh, many of the Britain's best fundraisers are women. And I was always taught by one of them, one of the best, she said, never be afraid to ask and always ask big because people can always come down. They will never offer you more, which I think probably is the wisest advice I've ever been given. Anyway, my thanks to Sheila, Sue, Tom uh, and, and Sarah, all the S's I note. note. Um, and Dawn, thank you uh, for you and, and, the, and the committee. And Melissa, who is our Zoom Meister, or I'm not quite sure what the female word for Zoom Meister is, but um, she does a fantastic job. And, and, and uh, thanks to the Equality Committee for organizing. I, I'd really be pleased if our panel could help us increase our diversity. And if you have any ideas how we can expand our horizons and accelerate our progress, we'd really welcome them. Uh, so once again, thank you to everybody.